Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Two for Tonight from Le Berger Francois. I'm Jacques Herringer. Tonight we're celebrating an anniversary dinner. The most important day, the day that you first gazed upon that lovely lady or gentleman that's sitting next to you. You know, our 25th anniversary here at the restaurant is coming up very soon. I was 10 when I became the chef here. <laughs> Would you believe 12? Tonight's anniversary menu is a wild mushroom Napoleon, followed by a traditional steak au poivre, pepper steak, and the finale, and this will astonish that special someone, is a molten chocolate cake with a hot lava center. <laughs> Let me show you how to make the first dish, the wild mushroom Napoleon. We are going to take a mandolin. And I'm going to take a russet potato, because those have a little bit more starch in them, and work out and just brown very, very nicely. We're going to adjust the mandolin and give you the potato slices, just like so. There you are. One more here. And you need them about this size, oh, about an eighth of an inch thick or a little bit less. And then I'm going to take, move that to the side here. I'm going to take a sheet pan and brush it with olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, of course. Cold pressed and delicious. This is going to give a little bit more flavor to the uh, potato crisps. All right. Then we will take the potatoes, put them on the sheet pan like so, and brush them again with a little bit more olive oil. And this is the basis of our Napoleon right here. All right. Then I'm going to take this and put it in the oven. And we're going to bake them about 8 or 10 minutes at 375 degrees. Let me get a towel here. And pull them out. That's been 8 or 10 minutes. It really has. <laughs> Right, and we have our potato crisp. I'm going to season them with a little salt and pepper, and they're ready to go. Now, this is the part of the meal that you make ahead of time. You make your crisp a little bit ahead of time. You clean and cut your mushrooms ahead of time, and you just bring that special someone, hey, it's an anniversary, into the kitchen, give them a little uh, libation, and saute the mushrooms, and put the finishing touches on your Napoleon right in front of them. It's that energy that's sexy. All right, you put those over here. Wild with, now, for our mushroom Napoleon today, we have an assortment of wild and domestic mushrooms. We have shiitake mushrooms here. We have oyster mushrooms. And we have true wild mushroom chanterelles from the Northwest. Something that is very important of these is to make sure to clean them properly, to put them in several changes of cold water. And this is the this is the part that stumps all of my apprentices when they come in. They take the mushrooms, they take the stems off. If it's a shiitake mushroom, you want to get rid of the stem, use it in the stock. Cut the mushrooms, put it in the water, and then they pour the water out of the bowl, leaving all the dirt in the bowl. So put them in a bowl and lift them out. You know, in the ancient Greeks dedicated mushrooms to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and that's where we get the word aphrodisiac. So if they thought they were aphrodisiacs, I'm certainly going there. And I'll tell you, here in, here in the restaurant, dishes with mushrooms um, sell the best. Let me just show you how to do it here. We're going to take a little olive oil. Now, a trick on sautéing mushrooms is to make sure that you don't crowd the pan. You want to sauté the mushrooms. You don't want to boil them. So put just a small number of mushrooms in there at one time. And if you need to do it in two batches, go ahead. You're strutting that culinary stuff, right? <laughs> Wearing only an apron, right? All right. Let's put a few mushrooms in there. 
That's enough, right there. And that's just about enough for our dish, actually. We've cut, uh, we've kept the smaller mushrooms whole and the larger mushrooms we've cut in half so they'll saute. And I'm going to salt and pepper them. Of course, I'm using sea salt because that's the whole pure product. And just toss them. Show off a little bit. Go ahead. And they just take two or three minutes. Again, you want to make a very hot pan to avoid a lot of juice running out. Should you get a lot of juice in there, just reduce it down. Keep the mushrooms in the pan and reduce them a little bit. Reduce that juice down. Let me just stir these up a bit. And they're almost ready here. And when they're just about ready, we're going to add, oh, about a half a teaspoon of shallots and just a pinch of garlic. As long as you both have the garlic, it's okay. Don't worry about it. All right. Saute them again. Okay. And you have your sautéed mushrooms. All right. We're going to put these to the side and reserve them. Don't you hate cookbooks where it says, keep warm? <laughs> put the mushrooms on a plate and keep them over a pot of boiling water while you prepare the sauce. Or you could put them in a low oven, cover them with a lid, and they'll sit there for 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, suppose something ensues. <laughs> suppose someone gets in the mood between sauteing and finishing. You're ready. You know how to keep them warm. All right, now we're going to take the same pan that we sauteed the mushrooms in because we want all the goodness and flavor of the sauteed mushrooms in our sauce. And I'm going to make a port wine sauce. I'm going to use a ruby port here. Uh, we're going to put our port wine in there. And we're going to put some balsamic vinegar, about a tablespoon, and reduce this down to thicken the, the port wine, concentrate the flavors, and dissolve all the mushroom particles in there to really give that sauce a great taste. While the sauce is reducing, I'm going to take our serving plate and build the Napoleon. All right. Now we're going to take our potato crisp and put it on the plate. We're going to have several steamed asparagus that we've prepared ahead and have handy dandy. And then we're going to take our mushrooms, which are still warm, and put a layer over the asparagus. Then we're going to take another crisp and put it on top. This is a wonderful dish. And you can do it at home. Don't be intimidated by mushrooms. They're very, very easy to saute, and they're so delicious. And then we're going to take a final crisp and put it on top. Now, our sauce is just about reduced enough, so I'm going to take some butter. Audience, what's wrong with butter? All right, we'll take about a tablespoon of butter, and this is what they call monte au beurre. We're going to whisk it in, if you will, swirl it into the sauce to give it a richer flavor, texture. And I'm going to taste this sauce here for one second. I love port wine. Then all we have to do, and I say do it with a flourish like this, take the pan, and pour it around like that. And voila, your wild mushroom Napoleon. Thank you. Our second anniversary dish is a traditional steak au poivre, a pepper steak. Uh, Jack, Jack, could I have a comment on the, uh, the balance of the meal? You see, you have an Anglo-Saxon couple here, and if you start with a mushroom Napoleon, I would have thought you'd go on to beef Wellington. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Touché! <laughs> anyway, we're going to do steak au poivre anyway. We never got along with the Brits. <laughs> now, for this pepper steak, I suppose I should have a steak. That would be good. What do you think? Robert, if you could bring out the steak, por favor. S'il vous plaît. All right. Thank you.
We have here a strip steak. All right. We've got a, we put a little pepper on it. Now, I try to use, and I do use, dry aged beef for the pepper steaks especially. This is a New York strip, and you can see here when you buy it, if you buy it whole, it has been dried on the ends here. That means they've taken the strip and kept it in a uh, temperature controlled room for about five weeks. A lot of moisture goes out of that beef, and on the top you'll see that it dries, and therefore you have to trim it and you lose a little bit more, but it has a much better flavor because that special someone deserves the very best. Something with the most flavor. After all, it's your anniversary. So we're going to cut two nice steaks from the strip right here. I get the biggest one. <laughs> of course. Of course. Now, we're going to put the steaks over here. And I'm going to get Robert, please take this, please take these steaks back to the kitchen and see that it gets there, won't you? Yes. <laughs> now, we have our pepper steaks. Pepper is probably the number one used spice on the planet. It was used for centuries in China and in India before Alexander the Great, they say, introduced it into Europe. And you know, the medieval uh, Europeans thought that Pepper inflamed the passions. Are there any volunteers here to test that? I'm sure it must because it is the most used spice on the planet. Now, we're going to use green peppercorns today, which is the immature. Pepper is a vine that grows up to 35 feet in length. It climbs up a tree. And when it is picked immature, you have green peppercorns. If you pick it a little bit later, and then you dry it, you have the black peppercorns. The final result is actually a slightly reddish berry, if you will, and those are soaked, and the outer skin is taken off, and you have white peppercorns, all from the same vine. I am going to take some cracked black peppercorns and season the steaks. Don't caress it, just go in. Okay, pound that pepper in there just a little bit so it, it holds, because if you just set it on top, it'll come off, all of it will come off in the pan. All right, here we go. Put that over there. Now we're gonna take our saute pan, all right, and take a little butter. What's wrong with butter? Nothing, absolutely. We're going to take a little butter and a little oil, saute the steaks, brown them a bit, and then I'm going to show you how to make the peppercorn sauce, the poivron rouge. Now, I have some here that are packed. These are a little different. These are dried green peppercorns, and these are green peppercorns that are packed in a brine. They're a little bit softer, all right? I'm going to take them and put a little cognac in with the peppercorns. I happen to have some here. Question, how much and cognac are going to put it on? Well, lots of cognac. What kind of a question is that? And I, I happen to have some here, and I better taste it to make sure it's good. It could be Napoleon. I mean, there's so many different kinds of cognac. How is it? Oh, gosh. J'adore le cognac. Oh. C'est tellement bon. All right. Mm -hmm. I better taste it again. All right. And when the pan is heating, when the butter just begins to brown, the pan is out of, you want a very hot pan with brown butter or, very, or smoking oil to sear the steaks. You want to give them a little color and a little flavor. All right. There's all sorts of different peppercorns. And you're going to have to have a pepper tasting party to find out which one is the very one. In the nude. With butter. With butter. All right. Let me put the steaks into the, uh, and meanwhile, I'm going to clean up my pepper because pepper is precious. You know, it used to be used to pay rents in England, as a matter of fact. The pepper rents, for instance. It was worth its weight in gold at one time. 
So we don't want to neglect our pepper. I'm going to brown the steaks a little bit. And I'm going to take a plate because after we brown the steaks, we want to keep them warm while we're making the sauce. So I'm going to set a pot of warm water handy. And then I'm going to brown the steaks. We have browned the steak. And I'm going to take the steaks and with a tong here, hold the steaks and pour off the grease. All right? Because we don't want to have too much fat. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with fat, but we don't want to mess up our sauce. And then I'm going to take the peppercorn and cognac combination. This is going to heat up the room. Be prepared for this. And it's not the fourth. It's not the Fourth of July. It's le 14 juillet. Don't forget that. All right. We're going to take our steaks and keep them warm while we prepare the sauce. Now, I am going to take in the pan a little bit of Dijon mustard. Why? Because it's from France, and it's excellent. And then we're going to take some. Put that over here. Some heavy whipping cream. You know, they were mighty stingy with that heavy whipping cream. I think we need just a tad more over here. <laughs> Don't all of you buy it by the gallon? <laughs> oh, all right. And, and then, then I'm going to take a couple of tablespoons of beef stock. You could actually get away without using the beef stock, but it gives a wonderful flavor to the sauce. And you can make a little stock at home. It is not that difficult. And your special someone will appreciate the extra effort when she tastes, he or she tastes that sauce. I'm trying to be politically correct here. I really am. All right. While the steaks are warming or staying warm, I prefer a rare or a medium rare steak. I mean, you have that wonderful beef. Once you cook it too much, you lose some of the nutritional value. And as far as I'm concerned, you lose the flavor. Keep it rare. Make it, just sear them. Keep it rare while you're preparing the sauce. And then let it sit there a minute or two, and it'll cook just a little bit more. Get it to medium rare while your sauce is preparing. It's ready to go. We'll turn it off. We take our warm steaks and put them over here and just spoon that green peppercorn sauce over the top. And this is delicious, OK? A nice Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon, something red, <laughs> will be wonderful with this. And that special someone is never going to forget the wonderful anniversary meal that you prepared. <laughs> Voila, steak au poivre. Our final dish for our anniversary two for tonight dinner is a molten chocolate cake. Do not be intimidated by this dessert. It takes a few steps, but the good news is it's all completely prepared ahead. 100% and all you do is take it out of the freezer and put it into the oven and bake it. But first I'm going to make a ganache. I'm going to take chocolate, the very finest chocolate from France. Of course. Do they have chocolate in England? Oh, they do. From France. It's imported Cadbury. from France. Oh, OK. Cadbury. All right. <laughs> We're going to take some heavy whipping cream for our ganache. And we are going to take the very finest chocolat and put it in there. And all we're going to do is melt it. We don't want to boil this. We want to make just enough heat to melt the chocolate. Now, this is simple. Everybody can do this at home. Once your chocolate is melted, we're going to turn this off, and we're going to put a little orange liqueur in it. I'm going to put a little bit, about a tablespoon, in there. And this is our ganache. Any questions so far? Easy to do at home. We're going to let the ganache, the chocolate filling, if you will, cool down. And then I'm going to take an ice cream scoop. Let this cool a little bit longer. Put it in the refrigerator and make two scoops of the chocolate ganache with the 
orange liqueur in it. And this is going to be the center of our molten chocolate cake. And when it's cooked and you cut it open, this is going to just sort of lava out. Oh, it's, it's a great dish. All right. We are going to prepare the molds that we cook the molten chocolate cake in. I have some butter here. What's wrong with butter? Nothing. We're going to line the inside of a ring mold with the butter. And then I'm going to take a strip of parchment paper, about 10 inches by 3 and a half inches, and I'm going to brush butter. Oh, I love butter. Mm. Can you use oil? No! <laughs> We're going to brush it with butter on the inside and the outside, and then we're going to line the mold with the parchment collar. You prepare all this ahead. Now you have your two collars ready right here. Set that aside one minute, and then we're going to make the cake. Take chocolate from France. <laughs> and we're going to take some butter. Nothing wrong with it, right? And melt that in the top of the bowl here. Chocolate and butter. I mean, can you think of a nicer combination? Semi-sweet chocolate still? Semi-sweet chocolate, absolutely. When the butter and chocolate melt, we are going to take some cream of rice and mix it in there. This is important to do this in the exact order. You take cream of rice and then mix that in and then we're going to take almond flour. What is almond flour? Ground up almonds. And yeah, what is a cream of rice, by the way? Cream of rice is just granulated rice. It's used for breakfast cereals, etc. And I'm going to move this over here. It's, it's used for breakfast cereals. You know what I use it for? To thicken like a lobster bisque. Traditionally, you thicken a bisque with rice. And you can take cream of rice and put it in there, and that'll thicken it. Now, if you put a wet towel down here, it'll hold while you mix it in. We're going to take three egg yolks, okay, and mix that in. It's like a cake batter, all right? And then we're going to set this aside. Let it cool just a little bit. It's really not that hot now. And I'm going to take, just set that over here. I'm going to take the egg yolks, the egg whites, excuse me, that we had, and whip them up and make a meringue. Just put it in your mixer, a pinch of salt, whip it up, and slowly add your sugar or evaporated cane juice in this case. And then we're going to take the meringue and put it in with the chocolate mixture. Can you add some more flavor into it, like vanilla, any other thing? Not going to add anything else to this because the flavoring is actually in the, in the chocolate filling. All right, mix it very, very well. And this is the basis of the cake, which we put around the molten chocolate. So we're going to take that and put it in a pastry bag which you have cleverly inserted into a bain-marie, into a pot. We have our chocolate filling. We have our cake mixture. And now we're going to go back to our molds here and take the cake and put it in the bottom, just about an inch or so in the bottom of each mold. Then we're going to take our chocolate filling seasoned with uh, orange liqueur. Put it in the center and then just cover the ganache with the cake mixture. You're going to put this in the freezer and forget about it. All right. We're going to take this and put it in a 375 degree oven for approximately 20 minutes. Straight out of the freezer into the oven? Straight out of the freezer. Our molten chocolate cake is baked and ready to go. I'm going to get a little serving plate out. You need to take a small paring knife and run it around the inside of the mold to make sure it comes loose. 
It just seems like this takes forever. You're going to do this ahead of time and just bake it, and that special someone is going to really appreciate it. Now, let's see if we can... This is going to work, I promise you. There we go. And then we are going... Then we're going to disrobe... <laughs> We're going to disrobe the molten chocolate, like so. All right. Is that at the same time you take the apron off? <laughs> of course that's the same time you take the apron off. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to serve it with a scoop of vanilla ice cream or some creme fraiche right over here. You take a knife in front of that special someone. You cut it open. Like this. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much.